Welcome, everyone, to the third talk in the Parkinson's Foundation's ninth expert briefing series, Freezing or Sweating Falls When Walking with Parkinson's Disease. We are very excited to announce that we have over 2,500 people registered from 36 countries, all 50 states, and Puerto Rico and D.C. In addition, our Ohio chapter is having a viewing party, and we want to give them a shout. My name is Heather Cianci, and I am your guest host for today's discussion. I am a physical therapist at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, part of the University of Penn's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. Please know that these webinars are not created in isolation, which is why I am very pleased to announce that this series has been designed in collaboration with our partner Parkinson's organizations, who are members of the Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson Organizations. I would also like to acknowledge our sponsors for this series, AbbVie, Synovian, and Lundbeck. Without their generous support, these webinars would not be possible. Thank you so much. Remember that this PowerPoint slide deck can be downloaded on the viewing page that you are looking at right now. Look at the bottom left for the download slides link, and you can download a PDF file at any time during this webinar. Health professionals can earn one free CEU through the American Society on Aging. If you are registered as a health professional and indicated that you would like CEUs, you will receive an email by the end of today with steps on how to collect your one CEU. Remember, you have just 30 days until February 16th to collect this free CEU. It is now my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Faye Horak. Dr. Horak is a professor of neurology and director of the Balance Disorders Laboratory at Oregon Health and Science University, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence, and the Portland VA Healthcare System. Dr. Horak is a physical therapist and neuroscientist who is internationally known for her research on the physiology and rehabilitation of balance disorders in Parkinson's. Dr. Horak's laboratory is considered the premier balance disorders laboratory in the world. Dr. Horak has several patents for new technology to measure and rehabilitate balance disorders. She has developed a popular new clinical balance assessment tool called the BEST test, and her novel instrumented mobility system called Mobility Lab allows clinicians and researchers to quantify balance and gait disorders using wireless wearable sensors. I've had the personal pleasure of hearing Dr. Horak speak on numerous occasions, and I know that you will really enjoy today's presentation. And now, Dr. Horak. Thank you very much. Today, we were going to be thinking about freezing, not the kind of freezing you see here, of course, and sweating falls, but we will be thinking about sweating, both for exercise and because of fear of falling. Um, I need to mention that I have a potential conflict of interest because you may be seeing slides that include some of the wireless body-worn sensor technology we use to measure balance and gait. What we're going to focus on today are three things. First, to understand how the brain controls walking and balance. Second, to discover what kinds of balance impairments or problems result in freezing and falls because balance is is really the underlying reason for, for both freezing and falls. And third, to explore what can be done to minimize freezing and falls. And we'll talk about new things that are coming as well as what we know about exercise and rehabilitation. So first of all, control of balance and walking by the brain is a very complicated uh, concept because so many parts of the brain are involved in balance control. The basal ganglia, which is uh, in the middle of the brain, is the part that's affected by Parkinson's disease. And normally, it can improve, uh, affect balance and walking both by going up through the cortical areas and, and down 
then to the spinal cord, and then more directly to the brain stem and spinal cord. However, what happens with Parkinson's disease, um, the basal ganglia has too much inhibition on these, both the, the pathways going up to the cortex and the pathways going down to the brain stem. And as a consequence of this problem, what happens with people with Parkinson's disease, they use other parts of the brain to control balance, primarily the frontal cortex in the, fr in the front of the brain, which normally we use for thinking. And so they have to use the thinking or cognitive part of the brain, the voluntary part of the brain more, um, because these automatic pathways from the basal ganglia down to the brainstem are inhibited too much. And we'll talk about the consequences of this soon. But first, let's think about freezing. What do we mean um, when we say a person has freezing of gait? It's, it's been or described as a brief episodic absence or marked reduction of forward movement of the feet despite the intention to walk. And most people who have this have the feeling that, that their feet are glued to the floor, so they're trying to move forward but their brain doesn't connect to their muscles and their legs to allow them to walk. Usually it's not really frozen in terms of the no movement at all, but associated with some rapid trembling or movement of the knees. And I'm going to show you how that's really associated with rapid weight shifting or balance adjustments. And we know that there are quite a few tricks that people can use to overcome freezing. I'm going to show you a movie of this person freezing now. So here he is coming towards a doorway, which is a place where many people freeze, either before an elevator or a narrow space. And what he's going to do now is use some tricks. He makes a, a voluntary sideways movement, a voluntary large marching movement, and these things can help overcome a, a freezing event but the freezing is marked by very small movements and these rapid trembling of the, of the lower legs. And you'll notice that making a turn to his left is causing even more freezing than straight walking. So he's using a couple more of these voluntary tricks to get going. Next, you'll see him after he takes his levodopa. And it's true that most people with Parkinson's disease who have freezing, um, the freezing gets uh, goes almost away or is much better when they're on their levodopa. But that doesn't mean his balance is per perfect because even people on their levodopa fall quite often. And sometimes it even makes their balance worse, even if it improves their freezing. So how do you know if you have freezing or not? Well, one thing to do is to do what's very difficult for people who have freezing of gait, and that is to make a turn uh, in place, like a 360-degree turn. This um, subject in our study is going to be turning, and turning is important because if you fall while you're turning, um, it's very dangerous because you could land on your hip and fracture a hip. Here you'll see a video of her trying to turn and how it induces freezing and balance problems, and that's why we're standing so close to her. She's turning in one direction, 360 degrees, and then the other direction. And we're measuring with the sensors um, how much freezing she has. So th this is the uh, easiest way to elicit freezing, even in people who don't freeze when they're just walking straight ahead. So turning is special. It, it requires a lot of dynamic balance control and it requires uh, movement of your head and then your upper body and then your lower body. So if you have rigidity, this is difficult to do. And it's involved in many different tasks of daily life. So what we did is we put um, a camera on people's belts, looking at their feet, and asked the question, well, how often do people turn in a day? So you'll see a movie of a person's feet as they're getting around their apartment. And we were surprised to see that people turn like over 100 times an hour or up to 100 times, 1,000 times a day. So turning, in fact, it, we all do more turning than we do walking straight. And so we think turning is something people need to be 
uh, practicing in rehabilitation. And when we think about exercise to improve balance and, and reduce falls, we have to think about including turning in, in those exercises. Of course, this makes you a little dizzy looking at her um, turning around in her small kitchen, but you can see how important turning is. In fact, we did a study where we looked at 30 people in, at home um, with, with Parkinson's disease and 30 people without Parkinson's disease and found that um, people with Parkinson's turn significantly slower than people without Parkinson's, and they take many more steps, like up to four or five steps instead of one or two steps to make a turn. And then we looked at the, how turning, the quality of turning was affected by the severity of Parkinson's disease in the bottom graphs. You could see that the number of turns for every 30 minutes um, was smaller and smaller, the worse the Parkinson's disease. So people start avoiding turns as they get more severe, and their turning velocity gets slower and slower. And then when we looked at falls, we found that what could predict falls was how people turn. So the variability of the number of steps that they used to turn was more predictive of falls than anything else. And I believe that this variability might reflect less automatic turning and more turning that has to come from the frontal cortex or more voluntary part of the brain. So why are balance and walking less automatic in people with Parkinson's disease, especially people who have freezing of gait, or what we call fog? Well, as I mentioned before, um, people without Parkinson's disease, usually balance and gait is very automatic because the basal ganglia can communicate directly with the brain stem and the motor cortex to control balance and walking, and so you don't have to think about it. However, as the basal ganglia starts to degenerate and um, people, in this case, let's say, are not taking their medication or in their off state or they have freezing, um, then they begin to use the front part of the brain, the frontal cortex, the more cognitive part of the brain, to control balance and walking. When they take levodopa, studies have shown that this helps them go back to using the more automatic uh, parts of the brain for, for balance control. And that's why probably there's less freezing. Now, all of us have trouble trying to do two things at once. Uh, for example, here's a man who's trying to cross a busy street while he's texting right next to a sign that says, Caution, Texters. It looks like uh, he's going to get into trouble shortly. And the, what we know is that walking slows down when talking and thinking slows down when walking. Well, this is even more true for people with Parkinson's disease, and even more true for people with freezing. What we call a dual task cost, that, my, that is how much does your walking and balance change when you're trying to think of something else, um, is even higher in people with Parkinson's disease than people without Parkinson's disease. And that tells us that they're using more attention and more cognitive control for balance and gait. Now here's two people walking, and they may both be using a lot of cognitive attention for balance, because how much attention is required for balance really depends on how difficult the task is. And the task in this athlete walking on a wire above the city is definitely challenging for anyone, but sometimes just walking even with a walker could be quite challenging and require a lot of attention for somebody with Parkinson's disease. So one thing to think about is you're not going to be asking people to talk to you or discuss what they want for lunch when they're trying to cross a busy street um, if they need to have all their attention on thinking about balance and thinking about walking because that could be quite dangerous in these situations. We did a study in which we showed that not only is walking affected by dual tasking or trying to think about something at the same time as, as walking, but also balance is affected by dual tasking. Here we have a man on, on the left side who is going to be tripped by a, a moving surface. The platform underneath him is going to move backward, like pulling the rug out from under him, and he's going to have to take a step forward to keep himself from falling. It's an automatic stepping response for balance. 
And then on the right side, the same man will be doing this, but we're asking him to make a list of all the food he had to eat yesterday. And so as he's thinking about all these different foods, then we pull the rug out from under him, and you'll see how much more difficult and dangerous it is for him. So here he is thinking about balance, and he's able to take a step when he falls forward. In the next movie, you'll see that now he's thinking about his food, and, oh, he falls into the harness, and we have to catch him. So the same situation, a slip or a trip, can be recovered when you're using your cognition and attention to help improve your balance control, and yet it could result in a fall when you're thinking about something else. Why is that? Well, one thing we know about these stepping responses is they require a lot of balance control. You have to shift your weight over to one leg so you can lift the other leg and take a step. And on the right side here, you see the increased force in blue on, on, on one leg before, before the person takes a step. And here you see what it looks like uh, when this healthy person without Parkinson's disease is forced to do a postural stepping response. He shifts his weight to the left, and he's able to take a quick, large, single step to keep himself from falling. These are automatic balance responses that occur very rapidly and automatically. And this is what it looks like if you look at the forces under his feet. In the healthy person here without Parkinson's, the green force goes up, and then he takes a step. Whereas a person with Parkinson's disease that I'll show you next, he shifts his weight to the right, and then to the left, and then to the right, and then to the left, and then finally takes a step later. So there's too much balance control going back and forth, and he's not able to stop balance and start initiating a step. So here you see a, a fellow who was off his medication with Parkinson's disease, who has freezing that makes him freeze even when he's falling, and he's not able to take a, a normal balance step. And in this case, because of that, he, he would fall into the harness when, um, when we uh, move the platform under him and he falls forward. Now, when we looked at the brains of people with Parkinson's disease and healthy people with imaging, um, what we found is that um, the connections between the, the frontal part of the brain and down to the brainstem where this balance center is were stronger than normal in freezers compared to non-freezers. And, and you can see that at the graph on the right, in which the bar for the freezers is larger, showing that there's more connections. That is, the brain is talking more, uh, the cortical part of the brain, the higher level parts, are talking more to the um, balance and walking parts than they are in people without Parkinson's or without freezing. So freezing involves too much cognitive control of balance and gait, so it's less automatic. The other thing that we found that's associated with freezing are some cognitive deficits, thinking deficits. And I think it, it tells us something about how the brain controls balance, that it's not just a sensory and a motor control issue. It's also a cognitive, and we're finding a mood issue. So let's look at this task on the right that's called the Stroop Inhibition Test. In this task, we ask people who see these different uh, words of colors to not say the word, but just say the colors. So try it yourself. Start from the left and go to the right on the top and just say the colors, but not the words. You have to inhibit the word in order to say the color. So you'd say red, blue, red, blue, green, pink, yellow, red, blue, pink, black, green. Everybody's a little slower um, when there's not an agreement between the color and the word because you have to inhibit what you want to say automatically. Well, we found that the worst people were on the Stroop test, this cognitive task of inhibition, the worse was their freezing of gait. And the better they did the test, the less freezing they had. 
So I think that the kind of inhibition we need to stop shifting our weight, to stop balance, and to then release the gait is reflected in this same kind of inhibition. That means the parts of the circuits in the brain that control this kind of cognitive inhibition are probably also involved in step initiation and in balance control. And in fact, when we looked at, on the right graph, you see the, the, the dual task cost, how much people slow down when they're talking. And on the left graph, we're looking at the Stroop test. We see that both of these are related to how much connectivity there is from this inhibition pathway from the top of the brain, the thinking part of the brain, down to the automatic brainstem part of the brain. And so we believe that they share circuitry for both thinking as well as balance and gait. Now, luckily, lots of studies have also shown that these kinds of balance problems, and perhaps some of these also these cognitive problems, can be improved with practice in people with Parkinson's disease. So, for example, we did a study in which we had people standing on a movable surface, and the surface would move very quickly, which would force them to take a step. And they started off taking two smallest steps. And with practice over an hour with rest breaks, we found that people with Parkinson's could improve. So on the right is a graph that shows how much their body center of mass um, moves backwards or falls backwards. Um, and you could see that um, the dark line are people that have taken their levodopa medication and they're falling um, not as far with practice over the blocks. And then we ha bring them back the next day and they still can re remember and are better than they were the day before. However, what we did find is that when we had people try to do this kind of practice when they were in the off state, when they didn't take their medication that morning, they didn't learn as well that uh, learning was impaired. There was some improvement, but not nearly as much as when they were taking their medication. So there have been animal studies showing that levodopa is important for balance for motor learning. And so it tells us that before we go to exercise or do any kind of uh, practice where we want to improve our movements, it's best to be in the optimal on state and take your medication. We also learned, though, that practicing walking, stepping backwards did not improve their ability to step sideways or other directions. So this, we need to exercise um, and it was a variety of different movements. So here you see a, a woman with Parkinson's disease. First on the le in the first video, you'll see her when she just starts to practice the stepping response. And then in the next video, you see after an hour of practice. So here she is in her laboratory trying to keep her balance and she had to take a lot of small backward steps. These automatic stepping responses were not very efficient because they weren't strong enough or large enough. However, in the next video, you'll see after just uh, practicing uh, for less than an hour, you can see now she looks like she has normal stepping responses. She's able to stop her body from falling backwards with a large step. So even though these things are fast and automatic, they you, they're something you learn, and by practice, you can learn to do them better. How about freezing? What do we know about freezing and whether it can be improved? Well, here you see when we have sensors on people's right and left foot, on the left, a, a control subject without Parkinson's disease walking, and you can see his angular velocity of his lower leg uh, in pink and blue as he walks along. Compared to a person with freezing, where he's walking fine at first and then has a freezing episode where you get that trembling of the lower legs. Well, what we are doing is we're developing some new wireless technology. Of course, here's a wired prototype that's not very practical yet, um, in which we measure a person's walking, and then when their foot is on the ground, we give them a vibration to enhance the information to the brain that the right foot is on the ground or the left foot is on the ground. And then we measure the percent of time people freeze. And as you can see, 
on the right, whether they do a single task or a dual task, there's a lot of freezing. Percent of time freezing was like 45% of the time when they didn't use this new biofeedback device, and it was much less when they used uh, this biofeedback device. Um, in fact, um, it improved as much as using a metronome to give them a cue, an external cue, like for a marching. So now I'll show you a video of one of our uh, subjects who had Parkinson's disease um, walking uh, before we turn the biofeedback vibration on and after we turn the, the vibration on. So here he is walking um, in the lab, and it's mostly in the turns that he freezes. Here you see a typical freezing type of a turn, which is dangerous because there's a lot of weight on one foot, and he has a hard time shifting his weight and takes a lot of small steps. He's, he's wearing the device, but it's not turned on right now. So this is his normal amount of freezing when he's off his medication. He does also state that uh, his freezing is much worse um, when he's anxious, and that freezing causes a lot of anxiety. Now you see him a minute later when we turn the vibration on. So it vibrates when his right foot is on the ground on his right side, and it vibrates on the left when his left foot is on the ground. And immediately, it really helped him quite a bit. We're still trying to understand why this kind of biofeedback approach helps some people more than others. And it's likely that some people benefit from one type of a cue, like an auditory cue, other people more from vision, and in this case, from uh, somatosensory information from the vibration. It might depend on the person, which is going to benefit people the most. So this is still um, um, in, in the process of being studied. While we do this biofeedback, we can also look at brain activation. Here's a person who has a special kind of system in which we can look at how much the frontal part of their brain is active. And we can see that before people freeze, the frontal part of the brain becomes very, very active right before and during a freezing event. And normally it's, it's less active uh, um, during a turn. But with biofeedback, we're able to decrease the amount that the frontal part of the brain is used and make that turn more automatic. And we're hoping when the turn becomes more automatic, that's why it becomes less of a freezing type of a turn. The um, other things that we know can really help freezing and especially fall prevention, is exercise. In fact, exercise is the only intervention that significantly reduces risk of falling, both in, in older people without Parkinson's and people with Parkinson's. Uh, medication has not been shown to reduce freezing or falls, except for, of course, levodopa imp improves freezing, but not necessarily falls. People that have exercises that are focused on balance were 20% less likely to fall. So what kind of exercise is the best kind? People are always asking, and I'm doing this. It's a complicated answer, but the best kind of exercise is really the kind of exercise you're actually going to do. That is, you can't just think about doing it. You have to actually do it, and several times a week or several times a day. And so a, and a variety of types of exercises have been shown to reduce falls in people with Parkinson's. I'm going to show you examples of studies from that include Tai Chi, um, dance, and an aerobic type of exercise that involves agility training. So first, Tai Chi. There's a, a large study that was published recently showing that Tai Chi like this, where a person is learning to shift their body center mass forward and backward over their feet, um, and they get to know their, their body better, and they get to know where their center of balance is. And they're not, she's not looking at her body, but her brain knows her body better, and this improves this kinesthetic sense. And the study has shown a significant reduction in falls in, in people who study Tai Chi uh, three times a week or um, several weeks or months. The other thing that can be improved um, that with practice is dual task walking that is ability to walk and chew gum at the same time or to talk and walk at the same time. Here's a study um, with just a few people with Parkinson's disease before uh, 
looking at their gait speed and how much it slowed down uh, before they practiced. After four weeks of practice, they were walking much faster while they were talking. And then a month later, they retained that ability to do two tasks at once. So even this uh, automaticity of walking and balance can be improved by practicing it. There's also a series of studies from Gammon Earhart's laboratory at Washington University where they show that dance can improve balance and reduce falls in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, they tried different kinds of dancing, ballroom dancing, like waltzes and foxtrots and tango, and they found that tango um, that was adapted for people uh, who never did it before and people with Parkinson's disease can really improve their balance. On the right, you see a uh, balance uh, called the mini best test, and you can see that in the beginning, the tango dancers and the people who didn't do tango had the same score. But then after three months, six months, nine months, and then 12 months of doing tango lessons, you see balance improving more and more in the tango people and balance gradually getting worse over a year in people who did not exercise by doing uh, the tango. This little video will show you what I mean by tango. And you can see why it might be good for improving balance because the person has to walk backwards and sideways take big steps and not let their upper body tip or, or fall. And they have to follow a partner. And sometimes they are the leader, sometimes the follower. And so there's a lot of good practice of balance control by taking dance lessons like this. I'm sure you probably heard about boxing because now it's becoming popular for people with balance problems to box. So why, why could boxing be good for balance? Well, one thing is when you rapidly move your arms when you're standing, you're throwing your balance off, and your brain has to anticipate every arm movement you make and every time you hit a punching ball in order to compensate for the destabilization that comes with rapid arm movements or with hitting something. So I'm going to show you this video of this man who practiced uh, with a trainer for four weeks boxing and you see in the beginning when he throws the punch, kind of loses his balance, and he's not rotating his trunk very well, and he looks like um, his balance is, is not very good in the beginning, and after four weeks, you'll see improvements. Take right feet. Pull back so you get the twist. Okay. Take right foot. Okay. Now here, here he is, uh, four weeks later. Big step, little step. Stay perpendicular, fine. Yeah. Okay, and let's stop. stop. Walking backwards is difficult, and he's learned to do that. At the same time, he's dual tasking by having to think and use his arms to punch the object there. Um, we're doing studies currently with training, both balance and gait, as well as thinking. So we call it an agility boot camp. In this case, a boot camp is where you go from station to station doing different tasks. And people are doing first fast walks with large arm swings and large steps, and then power moves, which is a more of an aerobic training with thinking big, and, and lunges, which would help to take big steps. And then obstacle course, walking sideways and through, do circles and turns and narrow spaces, some boxing and some Tai Chi. And then we make it even more challenging by adding cognitive tasks on top of this, by doing a soup task, for example, while their people are doing the lunges, or doing a dual task by saying every other letter of the alphabet while they're going over obstacles, or when they're boxing, telling them to, to know our goal so that they have to inhibit their movements, which is sometimes difficult. Here's an example of a video of a person. Um, at the beginning, he had very mild early onset Parkinson's disease, still working full time, but he felt like his balance was getting worse. And when we pushed him with very challenging skipping and using his arms, we could induce freezing when he went through doorways. There you go. Perfect. There's it. Good. Uh, that's not oh. good. Yeah. 
uh, and teach them how to take a, a big step and to shift their weight. So using these kinds of internal and external cues has been shown to reduce freezing, um, but it does require uh, thinking and cognition, you know, so that you can't do that at the same time you're having a conversation, for example. Um, I, I don't know of any studies um, yet, although some are going on, that show that um, practicing doing an aerobic exercise, for example, will necessarily improve uh, freezing, but it does uh, reduce falls. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from a person with Parkinson's in Michigan who wants to know, why does the freezing get worse um, when people are looking at me or I'm walking in a crowd? That's really interesting. Um, we just published a study this month um, about the relationship of anxiety to freezing. There's a part of the brain that controls mood and anxiety, and we found that it was much more active and connected to the gait and balance centers in freezers compared to non-freezers. So the um, anxiety can, um, that anxiety center can actually change the way your balance and gait work. And so we don't know exactly why, but we know that it's a real um, physiological change in, in the brain in which anxiety can induce freezing and freezing can induce anxiety. And so that's where um, trying to reduce your anxiety um, may be helpful to reduce freezing. And we're getting lots of questions from people with Parkinson's disease. I'm just going to kind of dovetail off of this for Dr. Horak, where they're asking about um, is freezing completely mental? Um, and I think she talked about that a little bit, but what they also want to know is how much of freezing is due to the medications? Right. That's, um, that's difficult. Like I said, there are like 10% of freezers don't benefit from levodopa medication, where 90% do have less freezing. Some people um, have less freezing after deep brain stimulation, and some of them start to get freezing after deep brain stimulation. So it's pretty complicated. Um, I believe that um, all of balance control is more mental than we used to think. And so freezing and balance problems do involve the parts of the brain that are usually thought of as cognitive parts of the brain. But whatever they do for thinking, they also do for controlling our balance and walking. And so those two things often go together, cognitive problems and balance and gait problems. And this question leads perfectly into what you were just talking about. A person from California saying that I imagine that people with Parkinson's that develop um, dementia or even possibly Alzheimer's would have more problems with freezing and balance. Is this true? That's really interesting. It's true that people with Alzheimer's disease have more falls. Um, and they have a different kind of balance problem, though, than people with Parkinson's disease um, because they don't get the rigidity that can contribute to falls. They don't necessarily get the bradykinesia. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they actually walk fast, but because of their poor balance and they're too much dependent on vision, they, they fall when they slip or trip. Um, I think it's true, though, that people with Parkinson's disease who begin to get more and more cognitive problems and develop dementia are more likely to fall than, than people who don't have the cognitive problems. People who have more tremor tend to have less balance problems and less falls as well. Uh, this question actually comes from a physician with Parkinson's disease in Colorado. He was diagnosed about 12 years ago and said that he's pretty much fully disabled now but because of his athletic background, he's able to catch himself where he thinks other people might actually fall. And his question is, is when his doctor asks if he had a fall, what really constitutes a fall and what should he tell them? That's, that's, really, that's really interesting and really cool. That, that means that his, his, your athletic um, background has helped improve your balance control system, your automatic stepping responses, your automatic balance responses. So... It's not good that when people walk or, or run that they're tripping a lot. That says they're maybe not picking up their feet high enough or they're shuffling. But it is good that when you do fall, that it was the body center mass is going outside of its base sport, that you can recover your equilibrium using a 
a balanced response. So I would say, well, I'm tripping more, slipping more, but I'm not actually falling because I have a pretty good balance response. So falls are usually defined by unintended landing on a lower surface. Like if you end up on, in a bed or a chair or on the floor, um, then it's a fall. But if you're slipping and tripping more often, it could be because your walking is such that um, you're more likely to trip. So I would separate in my mind the, uh, the the part where you're losing your balance and the part where you're recovering your balance. Thank you, Dr. Horak. And I just want to take a moment to remind everyone, uh, take a look at this slide here. We do have upcoming educational programs for health professionals, so feel free to take a look at that. Our next question, Dr. Horak, comes from a care partner and a spouse in Maryland, and they want to know, are there any specific ways to prevent festination? Okay, um, festination is the rapid, short stepping that can occur, either in the forward direction or the backward direction. And often people can't stop festinating until they get caught or they like run into a wall or something. The way I think of festination is um, where your body center masses, which is what your balance control system is trying to control, gets ahead of your feet, for example, and your feet can't catch up with it because the steps you take are too too weak and too short. And so you keep on falling and then you keep on trying to take another step and you fall and you take another step, but each step is too small to catch up. So it's best not to get to, into that situation because um, what you want to do is, is stop leaning forward. Um, and it's that lean forward that causes this automatic little festination. So it's better to stop Take a deep breath and take a big step. You have to think really big, and it might require imagining a, a point on the ground or a line that you're stepping over because external cues can help people with Parkinson's, um, whether they're freezers or not, take bigger, larger steps. And even sometimes imagining that point on the ground can, can help. And if the step is large enough, there won't be fascination. Fascination only comes from taking too short of a step. So thinking big, I think, would, would be helpful in that situation. Great. We have some similar questions from care partners and people with Parkinson's disease in both Maryland and Virginia, and they're asking about different situations where freezing can happen. Can it happen while driving? Can you have a full body freeze? Can it happen in the mouth? That's interesting. There's um, studies now showing that Freezing type events can occur with your use of your hands. So when you're trying to do something with your hands that's a coordinated action, you could have a period in which your hands kind of stop moving and do a little trembling before you can move on. And that can be helped with levodopa, and it's associated in people who have freezing of gait as well. I have not heard of people freezing um, or doing complex tasks like uh, driving um, or uh, but I think it can occur also um, with with speech as well so when people uh, find themselves in ability to think of the next word or to um, articulate the next word it, it can it can be associated uh, with a freezing event but remember freezing isn't just like stop moving and so you're not driving along and you suddenly don't move. It, it just means that your movements are no longer um, smooth and, and coordinated. Right. And we have a question from a care partner in New Jersey who wants to know, is treadmill training helpful for balance and gait? Um, definitely for gait. Probably less so for balance. Um, so treadmill training um, – is really good for getting aerobic conditioning. And people with Parkinson's disease um, often get cardiovascular problems from lack of exercise. And that, you know, causes disability uh, as well. And also um, aerobic training um, it can, on a treadmill can help improve walking, can make steps larger and faster. Um, and if you're not holding on to the um, handles or something, you can also be improving your balance, but that could be dangerous on a, on a treadmill. Um, so we did a study in which we looked at balance before and after treadmill training and didn't find improvements in balance, 
although we did find big improvements in, in gait. So I think the main thing to think about with exercise is to do more than one kind. So do what you love and do it a lot, but, but do a variety of things. So if you like the treadmill exercise, that's great. But then other times, uh, take walks around the block or, or on uneven surfaces in a hike or um, going up and down your stairs. Just do, do a variety of things. Um, and I think that would be um, the best thing so that some of the exercises could be better for your balance and other ones for your walking. Right. We have two questions here which are referring to the biofeedback device that you showed. Um, we have one from Chappaquan, New York, who wants to know, um, how can I find out about getting into your study or are there other studies? And then from a physician in Wisconsin who wants to know if you've tried the bio de biofeedback device on people who have had DBS. So um, th there's, there's a way for people to get involved in research studies. And we always, all, all researchers really need people with Parkinson's disease as well as um, other family members who don't have Parkinson's disease to participate. There's a national program called NeuroNext. Um, and online, people can sign up for um, joining medical research for um, all, all different reasons and for neurological disorders and and whoever has uh, research going on in their area then will be able to know that you're interested in participating you could also look at particular like OHSU website for uh, research studies you can participate in if you wanted to come here um, we haven't tried the biofeedback yet um, with uh, people that have had DBS deep brain stimulation some people with deep brain stimulation develop freezing or freezing gets worse, and we don't know yet if it also helps them. What we're doing now, however, is trying to get it out of the clinic and laboratory and into the home so that we're developing a more wireless system that you won't be able to see in the shoes so that people can use it in the home, and then we have to measure freezing in the home with sensors in the socks or shoes to see if... Um, it's going to work in the long run, not just over a short period of time. Great. Um, and as Dr. Horak was giving you some resources there, remember to take a look at our educational resources slide here. We have many different ways to stay in touch with you and help with many of your questions. Um, we have an interesting question here from a care partner in Rhode Island um, who is asking that if you put an extra thick sole on one shoe, Will it help you to focus more so that you can use the front part of your brain more? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it sounds like it could be dangerous, maybe. In fact, when, when people um, first get a new pair of shoes, that's probably the most dangerous time for their walking because their brain is used to um, automatically uh, counting for the properties of your shoe. And you're right, when you get a new pair of shoes of any type, you probably use the less automatic and more conscious part of your brain and more attention is required for you to walk safely without um, tripping because you have to lift up your leg higher if you have a thicker sole, for example. And so those are the kinds of tricks you'd probably want to do with a physical therapist and not on your own because it could be dangerous. Great. Thank you very much. I want to draw everyone's attention to the expert briefing survey. Please take a moment to complete this online survey for us. Your feedback is really important to us, and it really helps us to improve our webinars and to ensure that you get the information you need. Um, let's take a look at our next question here, Dr. Horak. Um, do, this is actually, this comes from our Ohio chapter. Um, they said that you had mentioned that you can teach a person with Parkinson's disease to use a laser. And uh, is this one of the only ways that you can help people to take larger steps, or are there other ways to teach people to take larger steps? So uh, a, a laser is, is one way that's helpful because they may be fine walking straight, and then they want to go into an elevator or, or in a doorway, and they need to bring the laser out. Um, the other thing they could do is you could find an app for um, a metronome on their phones, on their pocket phones, and um, they could use, if they're going to be taking a longer walk down the block or something, they could use the auditory cues coming from about uh, one uh, step per second or a little slower than that um, to help them um, take uh, regular lar larger steps. Um, people can 
learn um, to automatically uh, think about having those lights or the, the uh, auditory cues as well. So they internalize them after practicing for a while. But sometimes um, people still become reliant on the external cues and they're more powerful. So, and what you can do in the home is put lines on the ground. For example, um, in a small bathroom, you could put a, a, a tape on the ground at 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock that help people make a turn in a small bathroom so that they don't fall in, in the bathroom while they're trying to turn. It, it helps them um, take bigger steps um, in, in that situation. Great. Um, a question from someone else in Colorado um, who wants to know where is the best place to find help with Parkinson's disease? You mentioned you're a center of excellence. How do we find out about others? Well, this National Parkinson Foundation here is a good place to start. They, they have a helpline and, and a website um, that, that can tell you about all the Parkinson centers of excellence in, in the country and how close they are to you. And um, so that would be uh, one, one good place to start. I think if you're thinking that you want to see a, a physical therapist or a neurologist, um, you need to ask them, how many people with Parkinson's disease do you see? And those that see many people with Parkinson's disease are going to, of course, have more expertise than those who uh, see very few. I just want to take a, a mention here and say that people are really um, sending in the accolades, Dr. Horak. We're getting uh, information from a health professional in Illinois and some people with Parkinson's disease in Vermont who are talking about how well done this webinar is and how much your information is truly helping them. So thank you for that. And yep. let's take a look. Here's an interesting one. Um, this is from a person with Parkinson's disease. I'm sorry, I don't know where from. But they say, why can I always run when I cannot walk? <laughs> yeah, that, that is funny, isn't it? I wonder if running is more automatic for you than, than walking for some reason. When you're running, you're actually falling. Everybody who's running has their center mass outside of their base of support. And so you're actually falling and you're taking balance steps to recover. Whereas when you're walking, you have to do a more sideways weight shifting and maybe your sideways weight shifting isn't faster and large enough for you to unweight a leg um, um, or maybe your walking is just um, not automatic enough and and requires this cognitive system which is slower and involves um, more complex interactions between balance and gait so uh, I don't think everybody can run who can't walk but uh, certainly for you that's the way it is. <laughs> and we have a question from a person with Parkinson's in Minnesota. Can you please talk about the feeling of weakness that I get in my upper legs when I freeze? Hmm. So it's not only a feeling of your feet being glued to the floor, but a feeling of weakness. I wonder if that's part of it, where your brain is saying, lift the leg, lift the leg. But you still have a lot of weight on that leg. So you haven't shifted your weight off of that leg. So you're trying to lift your entire body weight um, and uh, when you lift your foot off the ground. Um, I think that's the problem is I think you have to voluntarily think, shift my weight to the left leg and then lift up the right leg. And then maybe your leg won't feel so weak because it's not having to lift as much, uh, many pounds. And another question from a person with Parkinson's. You mentioned um, many different exercise options. Can you speak about indoor cycling? Yes. Um, so there are some new studies showing that um, cycling um, behind somebody who, um, on a tandem bike can, can really improve people's walking uh, with Parkinson's because you're forced to take really fast and large cycles. I think cycling in the home could be good for aerobic conditioning and and, um, and it may help walking, um, but there's not a lot of balance practice happening there. Um, so you'd also have to include a, another program, let's say go, go to take Tai Chi as well, so that you can work on balance there and work on your aerobic uh, um, with the bicycle. Great. And a question from another care partner spouse team in Maryland. Are there any specific suggestions for avoiding retropulsion? 
retropulsion is that um, that can be very dangerous because people are falling backwards and they're taking those tiny little steps rather than a big step to stop themselves. So their stepping responses are too weak and too late. So um, one thing is to practice having good postural alignment. When people are more flexed at the hips and the knees and the ankles, they tend to shift their body center mass too far back. And so if, you're, if it's back near your heels, then you're really likely to start tipping backwards and then having to take a step. So the first thing, you have to avoid tipping backwards. So you have to look in a mirror and work with a the therapist to improve your body alignment so you're more upright and, and more weight is on the front of your feet and not back on your heels. And secondly, you need to practice walking backwards with big steps. So taking big backward steps are, is a necessary part of, of uh, preventing retropulsion because once you start tipping back, backwards, you have to take a really big step, and that can stop you from, from falling backward. That might require, though, working with a physical therapist so you don't fall because um, taking backward steps is, is a dangerous thing to do since you can't see where you're going, and you may not be able to naturally take a big step. But with practice, I believe people can improve um, this backward stepping and these, even these automatically triggered backward steps that are needed for balance control. Great. Thank you, Dr. Horak. It looks like we have time for one more question. And I want to remind everyone, if we don't get to your question and have that answer today, you can again uh, contact us at the helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO, number 4-P-D-I-N-F-O. And the question that we have here is, from a person with Parkinson's in Pennsylvania, and they say that they've suffered with neuropathy and other um, problems with their feet and find it difficult to find exercises that don't involve pain in the feet. Would you have any other suggestions of exercises that they could try? In fact, um, we saw, found that over 80% of people with Parkinson's disease have other things like neuropathy and, and like arthritis and things like that They affect their balance and walking too in addition to Parkinson's. So I would think if you have pain in your feet from walking, that exercises done in a pool might, might be useful, in a warm swimming pool, a therapeutic pool, they call it, where you can do large stepping and um, aerobic exercises and even practice your balance responses in a pool without endangering yourself. And with that less weight on your feet and the warmth of the pool, that might um, be useful to prevent pain and improve your balance and walking. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Horak, for all of your wonderful information today. It was truly a pleasure to be able to um, moderate this today with you. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors, Avi, Synovian, and Lundbeck, again, for helping to make this series possible. And remember that an archive of today's event will be made available starting next week on Tuesday, January the 23rd by visiting our website at www.parkinson.org. And I'd like to remind you to please join us for our next webinar entitled Parkinson's Disease, Psychosis, Hallucinations, Delusions, and Paranoia. That will be on Tuesday, February the 27th, again from 1 to 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and that will be presented by Dr. Christopher Getz of the Rush University Medical Center, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. So we thank you for being with us today, and we hope to see you again and hear from you again at our next webinar.